So yesterday we spoke about the, the, this, this interesting uh, psalm that we came across. You were there with your crook and your staff. With these you give me comfort. So as we meditated the idea that it's comforting to know that God will actually correct us. Right? It's comforting to know that God will correct us. So with our staff, with his staff, he will defend us. That's easy to understand, very comforting. But also with his crook, that's where he kind of catches us by the ankle or I thought it was actually around the neck, but either way. <laughs> it depends on the size, says our sheep farmer. Either way, uh, it's for convincing the sheep to do what they need to be doing fairly pronto. Uh, so, yeah, so, and this is comforting. It's comforting to know that God will correct us. So it's an interesting thing, like God will correct me. You know, God will correct me because he loves me. God will correct me because he loves me. Just like, again, any good parent, any good coach, any good teacher you correct those you love, not because it makes you feel superior, it makes you feel powerful. You correct them. Again, it's not even about you uh, uh, as a teacher or as a, as a priest or as a coach. Uh, you do so because you want them to know the truth. You, you do so because you want them to be free. So correction isn't something we like. But I, I just felt yesterday after I finished up the homily, I, was, yeah, I only have... I don't want to go much over 12 minutes where possible. Um, so I just felt afterwards that maybe that might have all ended a bit abstract. So it might be good today just to delve in a little to how does God correct me? How? So yesterday, hopefully, we've established that God will correct me. Today, let's look into concretely how God actually corrects us. Okay, first and foremost, the easiest one is Scripture itself. Okay, so if the Lord says something clearly in Scripture, then that becomes his law, if you will. So the Lord speaks to me then through scripture. So, for example, when, when the Lord says, you've heard how it says, you must not commit adultery. But I say this to you, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Okay, so the Lord is saying now, like, okay, adultery, don't do that. But even purify your hearts of anything that might lead you to adultery. Le uh, purify your hearts uh, of all that is, that is lustful, that all that wishes to simply use another person, okay? So then that becomes the Lord teaching me. If I have another opinion, I'm wrong, <laughs> right? If, I have another, if, if my opinion differs to God's, it's like, I mean, that little goldfish out there, he appear, uh, one of them, um, those goldfish appear quite often in homilies. But if, if, if the goldfish in there is convinced that he knows more about what's going on here. You know what you should be doing? You know what you should be doing with that stove there now? You think you're really... Like, how... Sorry, you little... How on earth are you, fishy face, going to give me advice on anything? Do you know what I mean? You little goldfish, like, what on earth do you know? Sorry, like, but what do you know? You know nothing. <laughs> Your world is yay big, uh, and you live, if we take good care of you, a year or two, and uh, hopefully longer... But, like, you know nothing. So who am I to tell God what he can and can't do and what he should and shouldn't do? We know nothing. Okay, so if the Lord says something, he's right. If my opinion differs, I'm wrong. That's hopefully fairly clear. Like, if, if my opinion is different to God, I'm wrong. Okay, I'm, we're, we're, we're not on par here. We don't talk, we don't talk to God as, as equals. We are not equal to God. So we don't tell him what to do. So if the Lord says something, it's true, get used to it. It's the truth. So, um, so the Lord will correct us through Scripture. So what, what Scripture then teaches is, is true. Now, uh, we need a massive conference rather than a, a homily of a caveat uh, to explain how, how Scripture works. Because obviously in the Old Testament there are certain situations that we don't find ourselves in. There are wars, battles... Uh, all sorts of, of things that don't justify us marching into war, marching into battle, slaying other people. Of course not. That's why you need the church. Okay, so we've got sacred scripture, but we also have the teachings of the church, so the tradition and magisterium, which help clarify what scripture is saying. Obviously, we're not adding to it, but we're clarifying it. Or we're also maybe answering modern-day questions that weren't an issue when scripture was written, so like genetic modification or IVF or things like that, things that didn't exist when scripture was written, using the same principles established by scripture, uh, we can now come to an understanding of what God's will is in these new circumstances. Okay, so again, the teaching of the church. 
Now, another wee caveat on that. Teaching of the church doesn't mean whatever your parish priest taught. Okay, teaching of the church is what the church teaches. It's what's in the catechism. And if you're not really sure what's in the catechism, Google it, really easy. All right, if you've got a, a question about Catholic doctrine or Catholic teaching, Google it and then please go to Catholic websites like Catholic Answers. There, 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 there are good sites out there or anything linked with, with uh, EWT and those kind of things. There are good websites out there. Do not go to Christian websites in general that don't like Catholics. Don't go to atheist.com to find the answers to what Catholics believe. Just go to good sources, right? And sources, a good source will reference scripture and will reference the catechism. If they don't reference either, then the guy's just writing his own opinion. Next, right? We don't need people's opinions. We need to know what does the church teach and why. Okay, so that's how you know if the, if the article, as, as the, whoever is answering, answering the question, is referencing scripture and referencing the catechism, then that's a Catholic answer. Uh, that's how we know. We have to be kind of shrewd about these things, especially our generation. We don't have time to be wading through vast quantities of information. We want the answer and we want it now. Good, so we have a quick scan. Is he referencing scripture, catechism? No. Okay, back to the Google search and take the next, the next answer down. Okay, so... Uh, how will God correct us? He'll correct us through scripture. He'll also correct us through the teachings of the church. Now, it may be that we don't like the teachings of the church. It may be that we find one or two of them somewhat difficult. Uh, when people are applying here to Holy Family, it's a question in the application form. Are there any aspects of Catholic teaching that you find difficult? It's kind of a trick question, because if they say, well, actually, Father, now that I have you, uh, does this, does that, does that, does that, does that, that application will be... <laughs> right? somewhat sidelined no it's okay. it's okay it's okay to have questions about I'm not really sure why as opposed to the church is wrong when it says we can have questions but I'm, I don't really understand the thing but I'm willing to learn I'm open okay that's, that's good um, we, if, if we understood everything right off the bat then you wouldn't need a place like Holy Family you wouldn't need the catechism we'd all simply know all the answers we don't so we're growing into that thing which is fine we're growing into a deeper understanding of our faith which is great but, again, if my opinion differs to the, to the teaching of the church, I want to be really, really careful here, because I may have a different opinion, but the opinion of the church isn't just the opinion of the present pope or the last pope or wasn't just written since you know, the 1960s, Second Vatican Council, whatever it may be. What the church teaches, right, is a distillation and a synthesis of sacred scripture and tradition for the last 2,000 years. So this is what Padre Pio believed. This is what Mother Teresa believed. This is what St. Joseph of today, or Saint of today believed. This is what the Twelve Apostles believed. This is what, like, it's all of this brought together. Now, you say, I disagree. There is a huge throng of saintly and wise people who believed or believe what the Church teaches, as it is. Do you really know better than them? Again, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not trying to be too blunt here, but I think at times in, in, in today's world, it's like whatever you believe is fine. That's absolute rubbish. Whatever you believe is not fine. Whatever you believe can be completely wrong. Just because you believe it doesn't make it true and doesn't make it right. Okay, there are plenty of people committing genocide out there and think what they're doing is absolutely fine. Okay, just because you believe something is true or right doesn't make it true or right. So we need kind of concrete uh, barriers that we hopefully don't bounce off, but at least they indicate what's out, what's out of bounds. If I'm disagreeing with scripture, I'm wrong. If I'm disagreeing with what the church is teaching, like, I just don't know how you're going to defend that. You know, This is how God corrects us, how he keeps us on the straight and narrow. And we mightn't even fully understand at the time why the church teaches what it does, but there's always a blessing in doing what the church teaches. We've seen this so often, even with different couples that we've known, you know, who've... Uh, uh, maybe gotten into a relationship and this, you know, there's the initial joy and passion and all that kind of thing and um, but they obviously, you know, because they're both people of prayer, decided not to sleep together or live together, great, okay and then it may happen that after two or three months that they, they just see it's, not, it's just not really working out, you know what I mean it's not, it's not what I thought it was going to be, okay so then they've gone through this dating process and now they go their separate ways, having lost nothing. There's no child in the middle, and we're fighting for custody, and every second weekend, or whatever it may be, like all, all, of the, all of that is avoided. And then they're now free to enter into other relationships with no complications. You know, God, God's plan works. 
It does. I mean, it, it, and then, or like, I know it, it can be a very, very difficult situation for, for couples as well when there's, when there are issues with, uh, with, with fertility and, and uh, IVF is presented very, these days, very nonchalantly as an option without any thought of the, the, the moral consequences of, of, of what happens during IVF. The, not just the medical risks, but everything that's involved, the number of, of embryos, that we babies that are, that are created and frozen, and like it's, it's just, it's far more complicated than it may seem. Just like this quick answer, I want a baby, can't have a baby, IVF will give me a baby, good, let's do that. There's a reason the church has to weigh it in and discover what's going on here, and then the same principles obtained from scripture say, sorry, but that's, that's, that can't be God's will. That is not God's will. So I think there's great solace and consolation in knowing that scripture and the church's teaching, they're, they're, they're foundational. Like they, they give us something that we can depend on. Finally, the Lord will correct us through our own conscience, our own conscience. We don't always have time in the moment, in a, in a particular situation, in a particular conversation, to Google what the catechism says, right? Uh, but if we're living in a state of grace, so if I'm, if I've no mortal soul in my uh, mortal sin, mortal sin in my soul, uh, uh, then that means like the, you know, I have the, this indwelling of the Trinity. So God lives in me. Now, if God lives in me and I'm open to, 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 to God's word, to God's inspiration, the Lord speaks in my conscience. So that way, like a lot of pro-lifers, and not just Catholic or, or, or Christian, but a lot of people who are pro-life, just simply know in their hearts that abortion is just, it just cannot be the answer ever. No one had to sit down and show them images of, of, of abortions or sit down and show them the reasons why. Just in their heart of hearts, they know it's just not right. It's not right. Okay, so this is like God speaking within a person's conscience. Now we can try and we can try and deafen that voice. We can try and push it down. We can try and avoid it. We can try and convince ourselves of other things. But generally speaking, the the, the light of truth will try to break through, which can be really frustrating within yourself because you want to just you want to, you want something to be true, and and you want the other side to be wrong. But there's this inner conflict because deep, deep, deep down, you know yourself, that abortion isn't the answer, or that whatever belief you had that, that uh, is contrary to the teachings of the church, that deep down, you know, it's just, it's not the truth. We want something else to be the truth, but, and we'll try and convince ourselves. We'll try and convince ourselves that it's not that bad, or there are worse things, or what does the church know anyway, look at all the corruption, and you know, we'll try and find a way of, of justifying our behavior. But deep, deep, deep down in your own heart, in your own conscience, that, that inner life that you have, <clears throat> that everyone has, that inner universe that exists within each one of us. That's where the Lord dwells and that's where the Lord speaks. Today in our gospel, uh, the Lord speaks about the coming of the kingdom of God, right? So the, 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 the Pharisees ask him uh, when the kingdom of God was to come. Jesus gave him this answer. The coming of the kingdom of God does not admit of observation. So you're not going to be able to measure it or say what date it is with any great certainty. <clears throat> there will be no one to say, look here, look there, for you must know the kingdom of God is among you. What is that kingdom of God that's among them? It's Jesus himself. Jesus, the person of Jesus, God incarnate. He is the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God isn't so much a place, like a walled city. It's, it's a relationship. It's being in Christ. We're in Christ, we're in the kingdom of God. So it's, it's not, he's not talking about like, like history and, and you know, the renewal of the church and all, all of these things that we're hoping for and praying for. He's talking about like the kingdom of God is, is life with me. And this is where the Lord speaks in, in our consciences, in, in this interior life with Christ. And that's where the Lord can guide us and also correct us. Because yes, we, we don't get it right all the time. And at times we want to convince ourselves that something that's wrong is right, but it's an act of mercy from God to correct us because when the chips are down, 
and the sands of time have passed and we find ourselves before him, I think we would look at the Lord and say, Lord, I, I wanted, to, I, I, I shouldn't have done those things, I shouldn't have believed those things. Someone should have told me. No one ever, no one ever taught me. No one ever let me know. I fell into that lifestyle because I never knew that, that another was possible. So the Lord will form our hearts if we're open. So we thank the good Lord for the way that he continues to act today, teaching us through scripture, through the teachings of the church, and in our own consciences. Amen.